Welcome to this third lecture in African American history and this is going to focus on the creation of the United States and how African Americans played uh, pivotal roles in the making of the U.S. as a separate nation. Um, before we get into that story, we do need to address um, slave rebelliousness um, in the colonial period and up before the revolution um, because it's very clear um, that slaves didn't just accept the conditions of slavery um, and um, at least not all of them did. Uh, many of them organized revolts um, and we have records as early as the 1660s of Virginia slaves planning revolts. Um, sometimes the revolts are caught before anything happens. Other times a few slaveholders are killed. Um, there are still revolts on ships. The largest of the slave revolts in the South happens at Stono in South Carolina in 1739. Um, and it's led almost exclusively by slaves from the Congo. Um, who organize an attempt to escape to Florida and along the way they kill about 47 white people. Um, when they are defeated, South Carolina imposes even more harsh regulations on slaves, including a prohibition on importing slaves from the Congo. The fear is that slaves directly from Africa have not been broken in and are more rebellious and more dangerous. So a lot of uh, Southerners prefer to buy slaves secondhand, slaves sold from the Caribbean who've been broken in by Caribbean slavery and then will be more uh, docile. Um, the fear of slave revolts led to a temporary suppression of buying more slaves, um, but the British um, are making so much money off the slave trade and uh, the triangular trade in general that they do not want to halt bringing in more slaves um, because of course this is lining their pockets uh, with cash. Um, as far as survivals of slave culture go, uh, one of the more interesting traditions that does survive in the South is known as Jonkanu. Um, it's got many different possible origins. There are Igbo traditions that seem very similar to things that you uh, see in Jonkanu. Um, some Yoruban festivals have similarities to Jonkanu. Um, we do know that before 1720 uh, there was actually a king, an Akan king, who ruled at Aksim. Um, who is probably the inspiration for the festival as a whole. Um, we know that it appears in Jamaica um, earlier than it appears in the United States. Um, and so in fact it may have been imported from Jamaican slaves who would be sold into the Americas. Um, and typically this, appear, this slave uh, festival appeared around Christmas time. So it becomes associated with Christmas Day celebrations. Typically in the South, um, slave owners would give Christmas Day off or New Year's Day off. Not always, not everybody does that. Um, and it's sort of like a break um, from the work traditions. And so there would be parades and dancing with elaborate costumes such as um, this costume shown here. Very many times the the parade folks would wear elaborate headdresses, would be decorated with beads and shells, um, accompanied by a band. Um, there would be dancing and singing. Um, you can see that um, where we see more traditions of Africans survive is definitely going to be the South, just by virtue of the fact that it's a greater population, a greater concentration of uh, slaves there who can maintain because they have a bigger community to maintain in. The middle and the northern colonies just don't have as many slaves in their populations. So in the middle, what you typically see in Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York is that slavery just isn't central to the economy. 
Um, you do find slaves in the cities. That's most likely where you'll see them. Um, more often than not, they're skilled blacksmith, um, metalworking, uh, printing, for example, those kinds of things. Um, but most middle colony uh, labor needs are met by indentured servants and the working white poor, um, especially Germans and Scots-Irish who come in large numbers to Pennsylvania um, starting in the 1750s. Um, in the North, you're going to see more rejections of slavery and the idea of slavery, particularly from the Quakers and the Mennonites, two prominent religious groups in Pennsylvania. Um, as early as 1688, the Quakers say that slavery is wrong. It violates um, God's natural laws. Um, it's an evil institution. Um, but most people don't really pay much attention to these two groups. Um, so their protest against slavery has very little effect at this time. Um, New York, interestingly enough, is uh, probably the uh, highest concentration of slaves in the middle colonies. And uh, we know a lot about what went on there thanks to the remains of a graveyard found in Manhattan in 1991. Um, thousands of slaves would have been buried in the area that they discovered, um, but about 420 were recovered and um, then reburied in a memorial. Uh, before they were reburied, Howard University did forensic work on the slaves and found that, in essence, in New York, they had been worked to death. Um, the bones showed uh, signs of breakage deformed muscle attachments, so intense physical labor going on. Um, trinkets found buried with these slaves included shells, belts of beads, um, possibly brought from Africa um, uh, or representative of African cultural traditions. Um, New York had enough slaves that there was a possible plot Historians are not sure, and most historians, I think, doubt there was even a real conspiracy in 1741 to burn down New York. But whites in the town, you know, growing fearful, stomped the conspiracy and executed a hundred folks, um, including white people, um, tavern owners, um, as well as slaves. In New England, like Massachusetts and Rhode Island, slavery is less common. Um, so you're going to find slaves working on housing um, and building, working inside houses as maids, cooks, those sorts of things. Um, they're restricted as property, um, but they're much more free than anywhere else in America because they could gather to socialize, they could participate in some community events. And starting in 1741, New Englanders even allow slaves the right to hold um, elections for kings and governors. Um, now these aren't elections that are real in the sense that these people have power. They're rituals that allow slaves to feel like they have a voice in their society. So they're prestige positions. So these kings and governors um, kind of speak for the black community, but they hold no real authority at all. At this same time, um, in the, by the 1760s, there's growing tension between America and Britain. Um, a lot of that, as you learn in U.S. history, has to do with the British wanting to get as much money as possible from the Americans uh, to pay for running the British Empire. So they pass a whole bunch of new taxes, the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Tea Act, and the colonists immediately react with a deep, hatred of this taxation um, because they say that it has not been done, uh, not been imposed upon them um, fairly because they've not had a voice in making those laws. So the famous phrase, no taxation without representation, arises at this time. Um, and interestingly enough, Americans, white Americans, talk about these new taxes as a form of slavery. And they say we're enslaved, we're enchained to British tyranny, which is just incredibly ironic, um, especially to slaves who were thinking possibly, you know, you don't really understand slavery, do you? 
But at the same time, having slaves does give white Americans a very powerful visual reminder of what not having freedom looks like. Now, as white Americans are um, talking about freedom and liberty, it turns out that these conversations are being overheard by the slaves. Um, for example, in 1765, Charleston slaves um, call for liberty at a rally. Um, so they're participating in public and making these cries for freedom as well, which really makes white people nervous. Um, and as we've already seen, Phyllis Wheatley um, writes about liberty in her poems, talking about tyranny and how she, of all people, could understand what tyranny is like and why people do not want to be enslaved to a tyrant. The next move for Americans is to declare their freedom, and uh, that leads us to the Declaration of Independence, written by Thomas Jefferson in 1776. As you guys well know, he said all people are equal. Actually, he said all men are created equal um, and endowed by their creator with certain rights. Um, we now know, of course, he didn't mean all men. Um, this document was, of course, to justify rebelling against the English king who violated the rights. But the interesting thing about Jefferson's Declaration of Independence is that the original first draft included a very strong condemnation of the slave trade, even accusing King George of England of creating slavery in America and you know, pushing slavery on the colonists. Um, so when he read this draft out loud, Southerners um, got immediately angry and said, you can't put that in the Declaration of Independence. Um, so they rewrote the draft and removed um, this famous criticism, which you can see down here. I have the original in Jefferson's handwriting. Christian King of Great Britain determined to keep open a market where men, in capital letters, should be bought and sold. Ooh, strong condemnation of slavery there. The full passage looks like this. He has waged cruel war, war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred lights of, rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, captivating and carrying them into slavery into another hemisphere, or to incur a miserable death in their transportation thither. This is directly mentioning the middle passage. This piratical warfare, accuses King George of being a pirate, the opprobrium or disgrace of infidel, infidel powers is the warfare of the Christian king of Great Britain. Wow, that is some powerful language against the slave trade. Um, ironic because Jefferson himself, seen here, was a slave owner. And this is a picture of his massive 5,000 acre plantation in Virginia, Monticello, where he worked slaves and then eventually had a relationship with one of them and fathered multiple children by her. A lot of Americans in the 1760s and 1770s are talking about why slavery is not a good idea, why it violates liberty. The more you keep talking about liberty and freedom, the more you start thinking about what that means. Um, and so a lot of them are saying that slavery just does not fit with the idea of America. But none of them are really will, willing to push the envelope and say, look, we just need to go ahead and get rid of this. Um, so they're not aggressive in tackling this issue. Uh, they're protesting, but not really doing anything about it. Um, we should, however, not take that protest as a sign that they believe in equality, because they don't. They believe in keeping America as a country of white men. So. The best that they end up doing is eliminating slavery upon their death. So for example, um, this is the will of George Washington where he says, you know, when I die, I want you to get rid of my slaves. And that's the best that he could do. He couldn't really follow his um, heart and get rid of slavery while he was alive. During the war itself, um, African Americans do fight for the American colonists, um, though that makes Southerners very nervous. 
Southerners fear giving weapons to slaves because, you know, they'll just rise up and shoot Southerners. Um, but the white Northerners say that slaves should be armed, they could help fight, and that after the war is over, they should be given their freedom. So um, in many cases, Southern black soldiers do get freed after the war. Um, but at the same time, Southerners will also help keep slavery going because, for example, in North Carolina, if you promise to fight in the war, the state will give you a slave after the war is over. Uh, when we do the final counting, uh, free blacks enlist in 1775. Um, 1776, George Washington accepts black soldiers um, into the army. Um, full authorized recruitment of slaves or free blacks begins in 1777. And in the end, about 5,000 African Americans will fight in the revolution. Sometimes that was not by choice. Sometimes slave owners sent their slaves to fight for them, often working out a deal, deal that if you fight, I will free you after the war. Um, so in essence, they were cowards. They're risking the lives of their slaves rather than themselves. Um, some free blacks are hired to fight for other people um, during the war. Um, and we know overall about 5,000 soldiers like this um, guy right here fought for the Americans. But we also know that the um, African Americans also fight with the British. Uh, the British governor of Virginia, for example, Lord Dunmore, promises freedom to slaves if they run away and join the British Army. So tens of thousands of these slaves do that. About 4,000 of them actually fight, and another 20,000 serve as um, diggers of ditches, nurses, cooks, laborers in general, um, such as the uh, young man shown on the left. Um, another 100,000 or so just simply run away while no one's looking. As you guys know, Americans win this revolution, and then they have to write new governments. And those new governments are silent on the issue of slavery for the most part. Um, each state writes its own new constitution and creates its own government. There is a loose general government for all of the states called the Articles of Confederation. And it's weak. It has very little power. So where you see a lot of activity happening in government, it's going to be at the state level. Um, that also leads states to have the freedom to talk about what to do with slavery now that the war is over and what to do with free blacks and how are um, Americans going to deal with their commitment to liberty and freedom, which they say they believe in, but now what are they going to do with it? At this very time, anti-slavery movements grow even stronger. The Quakers formed the first anti-slavery society in 1775 in Pennsylvania, in Philadelphia, in fact. Um, John Jay, um, who later becomes a Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, helps to found the New York Manumission Slavery. And in the South, Methodist preachers are preaching against slavery. So we see an increase in anti-slavery sentiments. Um, and here is a picture of a silver pitcher from the New York Manumission Society showing a white man reflecting light on to liberty and the freeing of slaves right here. After the revolution, then, northern states begin banning slavery. Um, Pennsylvania in 1780 uh, slowly abolishes slavery in its constitution. Massachusetts writes a constitution that says all men are born free and equal. And the uh, court in 1783 rules that applies to slaves uh, as well. Slaves themselves in Massachusetts file lawsuits to get their freedom. And then slavery soon just disappears. By about 1800, most northern states have banned slavery. Um, on the right is an example of a woman, Elizabeth Freeman or Mumbit, who was mistreated by her mistress um, 
you know, hearing all this talk of freedom. So she came to a lawyer, Theodore Sedgwick, and uh, he took her case to help get her her freedom. Here's just a map showing where slavery is allowed and not allowed. Um, it's banned here in the Northwest. Um, it's gradually ended here in New York and Pennsylvania and Rhode Island and Connecticut. It's banned here in the green areas. Um, in the South, it is still very much legal. As far as the national government goes, not the states, um, the mo most major change in anti-slavery comes with the Northwest Ordinance, which was passed in 1787 to create a government for this area here, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Um, this Northwest Ordinance prohibited the ownership of slaves, which was a major victory for anti-slavery sentiment. Um, and created basically an anti-slavery North, which is going to continue to be a problem as we get closer and closer to the Civil War. Um, however, we shouldn't take this as a sign that um, everything's hunky-dory and lovely in Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, etc. Um, because those states actually tried to discourage African Americans from moving there. They did not want free black populations. Um, Ohio, for example, in 1804 passed a series of black codes to make it very hard for African Americans to live in Ohio. Um, the codes were so bad that a group of about uh, 1,200 African Americans eventually just leave Cincinnati to go move to Canada. And Canada says, uh, very, very, uh, with a lot of shade in it, says to the Ohioans, basically, look, uh, up in Canada, we don't see a distinction in the color of people's skin, so they're certainly welcome to come live here. Um, there are free black communities in the United States, um, both North and South. About 27,000 free blacks in the North in 1790, and about 32,000 in the South. Um, so even larger in the South, mostly like places like New Orleans, for example, that's where you'll see the bigger free black communities, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, these free black communities um, got their freedom in a lot of ways, sometimes serving in the war. Um, sometimes the owner freed them after death. Um, they might run away and get their freedom. They could buy their freedom. So for example, a slave in Charleston won the Charleston lottery and bought his freedom. Um, these are just two pictures of free blacks um, in the north. Um, Julianne Jane Tillman, a preacher of the AME uh, church, and then another free black preacher of the north, Absalom Jones. Boston, for example, boasted in 1790 that all of its black residents were free, less than a thousand black residents overall. Most of the other free black populations in the north are in New York and Philly. However, free does not mean equal, and they weren't allowed to vote um, in many cases. They were considered inferior by white, fee white people. They worked the worst jobs, um, so they're still socially mistreated. Um, some did, however, rise to power and prominence, um, such as Paul Cuffey, a black Boston shipper. He's pictured here on the right. Um, he was a noted leader for the black community in Boston. Um, he even came up with a plan to take free black Americans to Africa um, to create a free black colony there in, in Sierra Leone. Um, it was too costly and it didn't really work out. But it did anticipate something that will come about by 1815, another colonization movement to take free black Americans to Africa. Free blacks in the United States um, often had to carry identification to show that they were free um, in the form of papers. So they might, police might ask you for your papers or this uh, badge, for example, in the city of Charleston, um, which has what looks like a toboggan on it. That's a freedom cap or a liberty cap, which is an ancient Roman image of freedom.
and you'll often see it on the end of a stick or a staff. By the end of the 1780s, many Americans were upset with the Articles of Confederation and decided to write a new, more powerful national government, which we call the Constitution. And as you guys well know, that frame of government does include slavery. For example, the question of importing more slaves from Africa, will the Americans continue to do it? And the answer is yes, it will be allowed, but only for 20 more years. Another question was representation. Will slaves be counted in the populations of the southern states? And the northerners don't want that because they say they're slaves. You're not giving them any rights, so why would you count them? Um, and one northerner, in fact, says, if you want to count your slaves, I should be allowed to count my cows for representation. Eventually, they compromised, and we get the three-fifths rule. So for every five slaves in the south, they would be counted as three people in the population uh, for the purposes of deciding how many representative Southerners got in Congress. Um, there is a provision in that Constitution that says runaway slaves must be returned. And the interesting thing about all of this is that despite all these ways that slavery is there, the word slavery is never mentioned. It's almost as if people knew that slavery is an embarrassment, so they don't use the word slavery, they just say things like all other non-free persons. Um, African culture is kept alive in um, the early United States um, despite mistreatment, despite slavery, despite um, the hardships of lives for African Americans. Um, often that culture is maintained in secret because slave owners see African culture as a source of rebelliousness. Um, so publicly, slaves obeyed, looked like they were doing what you wanted them to do, but in private, they maintained their customs. Um, for example, their quilting traditions, typically, like this quilt here, had African designs in them. Um, song and dance traditions reflect um, Africa and what cultural traditions they brought with them. Words um, and names survive. Just an example of a word that's African in origin that survives, tote, as in a tote bag, or I'm going to tote something. That word is probably from Kikongo language, tota, which means to pick up in Africa. Another way you can see survival is through African naming traditions. So Africans gave names based on days of the week. Um, or position, like if you're the firstborn child, the secondborn child, your name might be a geographic marker, so where you are from. And in America, those survive, kind of, um, after they're being sort of translated into an American form. So, for example, the African traditional name of Kujo, um, which means Monday, you might see as an, a slave named Joe or Kujo. Bobo, which is another African language name for Tuesday, just might become Bob. Um, Kweke uh, might become Jacob. So a white person's hearing this sound and they're just thinking, oh, I'll just name you the closest thing. Kweke sounds like Jacob. Uh, Jacob. Um, and that's the name for Wednesday. Yao is Thursday, so that might become George in some cases. Danjuma is Friday in one African language, so we'll just call you Dan. Um, Kwame, Saturday, in many cases that actually got preserved as Kwame. Um, Boseda, um, or Sunday, which often shows up as the name Boston. So you might hear, for example, Boston King, a famous black loyalist during the American Revolution. Religion was important to slaves, um, even though there was a debate over whether or not Christianity applied in full and how much did it apply. In the end, most people agreed that Christianity was open to everyone and that slaves should be baptized and welcomed into the religion. However, slaves would be forbidden to practice outside of 
the white man's way. So um, if you had another religion, say Islam, that would be forbidden. Or your own version of Christianity, say mixed with your traditional African faith, slave owners would not let you do your religion your way because of the fear that it might lead you to talk about freedom, which might lead you to then revolt. So slaves are often ba uh, banned from gathering in large groups, even for prayer meetings, and they often had to do that in secret. Um, and when they were allowed to gather, it was often under the watchful eye of the master. As in this picture here, so the master sits very much in the center of the preaching. Um, I don't think this guy back here really likes it, doesn't look too happy about it. Maybe he's been working too hard. And the preacher himself would be limited to passages um, that weren't too controversial. So don't preach on anything about revolting or fighting back. Preach on things like obedience and being submissive and bowing down to the you know, authorities and the powers. Um, slaves were often not welcome in Christian churches, in white churches in the north um, or the south. And when they were, they were often told they had to sit in special sections and balconies, for example. So they would never be allowed to mix with the white congregations. So that um, typically led to a lot of frustration upon, on the part of black um, Americans. Um, the one exception was Lemuel Hayes, uh, who's a pastor in um, Vermont of a white church. Um, he had a white mother and an African father, um, and he rose up and became a well-known um, pastor and had a congregation. But he's a rarity. So African Americans then decide the best thing they can do is just make their own congregations. Um, so this is where we get the origins of the African Methical, Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church, founded in uh, Pennsylvania in 1787 by Richard Allen. African Americans also want to be educated. They see education as a way to improve their lives and the uh, lives of their children. However, it's very difficult for them to get an education. In the North, um, they have to build their own schools, as Paul Cuffey did. Um, in uh, Quaker congregations, you can have black students go to Quaker schools, but Quakers are a small group of people. Um, the black citizens of Boston actually decide to go and build their own school after the city refused to give them permission for black children using white schools. In the South, education's even harder because whites are afraid of literate African Americans. Sometimes white teachers will teach black slaves and free blacks to read and write in secret. So you do find um, African Americans in the South learning to read and write but not openly. And by 1800, many southern states actually just flat out ban the teaching of slaves. So they will never get the ability to communicate easily and thus start a revolution or rebellion. Um, this is the Abiel Smith School in Boston, uh, one of the first schools built exclusively for black students. In science and medicine, African Americans do make some contributions to the creation of the early United States, though they are um, exceptions to the rule rather than representative of what's really going on. One of them, for example, is Benjamin Banneker, who's the greatest black scientist of the revolutionary period, um, educated in a Quaker school. He's born free, um, becomes a skilled uh, mathematician and engineer, um, writes his own almanacs because in this time period nobody has a cell phone and so in order to track what's happening during the year you have to buy an almanac um, so you know calen calendrically what's going on and holidays and those sorts of things. Um, an almanacs also give lots of scientific data and geography, planting recommendations, those sorts of things. Um, 
He's best remembered for his survey work on Washington, D.C., which he had to step in and do when the French engineer, uh, Pierre uh, Charles Lafont, has a hissy fit and walks off. And so Banneker rescues um, all of that work. Another one who is not as well known is James Durham. Um, he was the first black doctor in the United States. He was a slave. Um, his owner taught him basic medical training, um, and he worked on some more training with another person. Um, eventually, he studied with a famous Philadelphia physician, Benjamin Rush, um, and uh, they set up a profitable practice together working on respiratory diseases and ailments. Um, he has an informal education, which is common at this time period, so he's, he's not allowed to go to, say, a medical school, a university training, but he does um, become quite successful until he just disappears in 1802, and we really don't have any idea what happens to him. Um, so that concludes the lecture on African Americans in the Revolution and the Early Republic.